Blackbird. Okay, so I'm recording this. It looks like we have one person here. Um, I have a little um, kind of PowerPoint to go through for um, like experimental design, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those first. So just let me know what you might need some help with. So I'm going through the lab mm -hmm. and the question about whether or not it's a normal distribution. Uh, the thing is, I know that the mean and the median are the same, but looking at the graph, it look doesn't look very normal because of it looks like it has too much of tail to the left and also standard deviation probably won't work very well with the gaps in between bins. Does that make sense? I'm going to pull up um, the lab and then we can look at it together. Let's see. Do you know exactly which question you're looking at? Uh, or is it just more general? Two to Technically two to four. Okay, let's pull up. Let's pull up the lab. Okay, so okay, so let me up this let me share my screen sorry i think i'd be a pro at zoom by now but okay so let's see we are looking at question two okay so for this you're going to want to use the data that they give you and then you're going to want to plot a frequency distribution. Um, and your plot, based off what you plot, you're going to want to assess whether it is a um, normal distribution or not. So based off what your histogram looks like, let's see, histogram. So the key for normal distribution is it's like the standard like bell curve where it's like about half falls to the left and half falls to the right. Um, and then um, you want your mode to be in the um, middle of like the normal distribution. So your main peak would be um, in the middle. So like this would be an example of a histogram with a normal distribution because the most occurring number falls in the middle. So you were saying the one that you had fell a little more to the left or to the right. So that would mean that it's likely not a normal distribution. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, so like this likely wouldn't be a normal distribution because the mode is slightly to the right. Um, of the standard bell curve. Um, okay, do you have more questions about the lab? No, not really. That was just the only thing I was concerned about. Okay, let's see, is this the... Okay, all right. I have created a little PowerPoint um, to kind of go over um, experimental design. Um, before I do that, um, I was just going to talk a little bit about myself. So my name's Lauren. I'm one of your academic associates. Um, like you all, I also went to Arizona State for my undergrad. I got a degree in biology and global health. And then I actually went on to get my master's at Arizona State in global health. Um, so I graduated my bachelor's in 2020, so quite a year to do that. And then my master's in 2021, my charter just unplugs. So one second. 
Um, but when I was an undergrad, I did a lot of research on um, cascading hazards. Um, so if you're interested in that, but also most of my research for my thesis for my undergrad and master's was in um, on the intersection of human trafficking and healthcare. So if that's something you're interested in or want to learn more about, or just more broadly how to get involved in research as an undergrad, I can kind of help you talk you through that. And then, like I said in my introduction post on Discord, I am going to PA school this summer. So I spent most of my time as an undergrad kind of calling myself a pre-med, but um, eventually realized that I think PA school is the better path for me. So if you have questions about pre-PA or pre-med or even um, kind of grad school, PhD, I can probably field most of those. So if you have any questions like that, let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. So the first talking point, um, kind of key learning objectives were about experimental design. So um, let's see. Okay, make this smaller. So control. So an experimental design control references a type of experiment where we control for all conditions, ideally, except for one or a few factors that we're trying to learn more about. So um, an example would be like if a pharmaceutical company is trying to test out a new drug. Um, so they're going to want to control for all miscellaneous factors as much as they can, except for the drug. So the sample of people receiving the drug would be the experimental group, whereas the group receiving the placebo would be the control group. Um, and then other variables, like I said, such as like age, sex, are kept similar to kind of control for miscellaneous variables because we don't want that to impact um, our treatment group. And then treatment and subjects. So treatment refers to the variable that you're studying. Um, subjects are often given the treatment and they're often referred to as either the treatment or experimental group. And subjects can be really anything that you apply the treatment to. So um, there's, I made up a fake pharmaceutical company testing a new drug. Um, the subjects are recruited and then randomly divided into two groups. The subjects of group one receive a placebo sugar pill while the subjects of group two receive the um, drug that they're testing. So in this case, what would the treatment group would be the subjects in group two that are receiving the drug, or in this case, also the treatment. And so that would be group two is the treatment group. And then the subjects would be the random um, people that were recruited by this pharmaceutical company to um, be a part of their drug trial. Block, so an experimental design, a block study is where subjects are divided into blocks based on some known um, characteristic typically. So this could be like sex, like your biological sex, male or female, um, your age, and then other just like similar characteristics. And then from these blocks, they are assigned to either the treatment or control group. So this is an example. So a bunch of study participants are recruited and instead of randomly dividing them into the treatment or control group, they are blocked into groups first. Um, so sometimes they call these strata too. So we have block one, which is all in this scenario, all males of the study participants. And then subgroup two is all females that are out of the study participants. And then from here, they are randomly assigned to either the treatment or control group. And that's kind of another way to um, enhance control because it eliminates um, varying factors between sex. So it kind of controls for different um, differences between the sexes. Randomization. Um, so this is kind of um, one of the easier definitions. It's just meaning that you have to randomly assign the subjects to the treatment in an experiment. And then stratified randomization refers to the first, um, first sorting subjects into blocks. So um, again, blocks are sometimes referred to as strata. So stratified randomization is just, you know, um, putting people into groups based off a characteristic that the researchers want to typically control for. And then, oops. Um, and then I think this was going over, let's see if this video will work. Um, 
inductive and deductive reasoning, um, I still get confused by it. I think it's can be kind of confusing. So I found this video on YouTube and I thought it was helpful. So I thought I would share it with you all. Let's see if it load. Let's conduct an experiment. Consider a basket full of mangoes. You want to check whether they are raw or ripe. One can find out by observing the mangoes individually. So we start the process. We pick up a mango from the basket and observe it. Let's say we find the mango to be raw. Then we pick up another mango from the basket, observe it and find that that's raw as well. Based on this, many of us would conclude that all the mangoes in the basket are raw. What exactly are we doing here? We examined a couple of mangoes in the basket and accordingly arrived at a general conclusion. What is the conclusion? We generalized the idea by saying that all the mangoes in this basket are raw. So by observing a specific outcome of the experiment, we concluded the observation in a generalized form. This approach of reasoning from specific to general is called as inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is logically true, but may or may not be realistically true. What does that mean? Let's consider an example. Statement one says that the mango is a fruit and statement two says the box is full of fruits. We try to draw a conclusion from these two statements. From these statements, we draw the conclusion that the box is full of mangoes. Here, statements one and two are true, but the conclusion drawn, although logically true, can be false if the basket contains any other fruit apart from mangoes. It's logically true, but not definitely true. So that was inductive reasoning. On the other hand, we have deductive reasoning where the approach is from a general argument to a specific conclusion. Unlike inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning is always true. For example, statement one says that all mangoes are fruits and statement two says that all fruits have seeds. What conclusion can we draw from these two statements? We can draw a conclusion saying mangoes have seeds. Here statements one and two are true and the conclusion will also always be true. All mangoes have seeds. So the two examples give us a clear idea about inductive and deductive reasoning. Take a few seconds to review both the cases. Now, let's go back to inductive reasoning. Did you know that inductive reasoning is frequently used in mathematics? By observing the pattern that exists in a particular case, we induce a general conclusion from that outcome. The conclusion we arrive at based on inductive reasoning is called as conjecture. Conjecture is a hypothesis that has not been proven. Just because we observe a pattern in many cases doesn't mean it holds true for all cases. Conjectures must be proved for that particular case. To prove such conjectures, the principle of mathematical induction is used. Let's discuss about it in detail in our next video. So I like going to YouTube if something's confusing to me and then um, most of you are kind of early in your biology courses. And um, I think actually the intro to bio courses were some of the hardest courses I took as an undergrad, just because I didn't know how to study. Um, and I'm still figuring out how to study because you kind of always have to change your techniques and stuff for different classes, but um, you kind of have to experiment with what works for you. But um, I've always found YouTube super helpful. And then um, creating like, scenarios or mnemonics really helps me too so like for inductive reasoning it's i and then specific to general so i think like i swear to gosh like that's how i remember it and then i know that deductive is the opposite um so just figuring out like study tips and stuff that worked for you and then that was done with that video and then i had a a video i liked for um for independent versus dependent variables, but 
apparently it's not playing. Um, I can send that video um, in the Discord or honestly, if you just Google independent versus dependent variable on YouTube, um, that one should pop up. Um, let's see, do you have any more questions? Okay, and then like I said about studying, um, it's really hard. Um, and I don't think I actually figured out how to like successfully study until like my junior, maybe senior year of undergrad. Um, I just kept doing what worked for me in high school and it didn't work that well in college. And I spent way more time um, doing like passive studying. And I think if I would have done some of the techniques that they talked about in this video, I would have had more success with um, less, um, time so i'm going to play this video because i thought it was really helpful i would bet i would bet that you are not studying anywhere nearly as effectively at, as you could be and why should you care well if you study more effectively you can learn more and retain more in less time that translates to less time studying better grades and more time doing the things you actually enjoy in this video, we'll cover all the study hacks I learned in medical school and what I wish I knew back in college. What's going on, guys? Dr. Jabal, MedSchoolInsiders.com. This video is an updated version of my first ever video, Pre-Med Study Strategies, What I Wish I Knew in College. By following the tips in this video, you'll be studying less and earning better grades immediately. I just wish I was studying like this sooner. Without further ado, let's get to it. First, active versus passive learning. The default studying pattern we all employ is passive learning. It's easier, requires less effort, and overall, it's just more comfortable. Active learning is more challenging. It's less comfortable, but it's much more effective. There are four steps we must address to actually use active learning. Steps one and two are about obtaining the information, and steps three and four are about reviewing and reinforcing the information. The first step is to identify what is important. Not all information is created equal. To employ active learning, you must constantly be sorting information and assessing its relative importance. Second, organize the information in a way that you understand. Again, as an active process, this isn't going to be just copying and regurgitating the information. Instead, you're going to be doing the difficult task of synthesizing the information in your own words, in diagrams, or in other study aids. For example, I love creating tables and charts. Let's say I was comparing macro minerals like sodium, potassium, and chloride in the GI system. I would take the extra time and effort to extract the relevant information and organize it in a chart format. The process of creating this chart was enough to improve my understanding of the concepts, and now I also had an excellent study tool to review at a later date. Number three, memorize. You need to memorize the information in an active way. I'll get to how to do that later. And lastly, apply the information. You can do practice questions from the textbook or online services. Old practice tests or practice quizzes from your professor are also fantastic resources. Next, let's talk about your studying environment. This is an area requiring more personalization, so it's key that you figure out what works best for you. First, the location. Do you prefer coffee shops and libraries or studying at home? If you've seen the video of my workspace, then you understand why I love studying at home. Many people do, however, get easily distracted at home, and that's why they prefer the coffee shop or library since it helps them focus on the work at hand. Next, group versus solo studying. Are you studying by yourself or with other people? My split varied, but it was roughly 50-50, maybe a little bit more time studying solo. In group study, the rate of reviewing material is slower, but the main benefit is working through and reinforcing difficult concepts while also keeping you motivated and sane. That being said, Groups need to be small. Study with only one or two other people. Groups larger than this have severely diminishing returns because you are going to get distracted and your productivity will plummet. One of the biggest advantages to group study is the ability to teach what you have learned. This teaching reinforces the material for yourself and you also help out your friends and classmates. I go over how to use this strategy in my Feynman Technique video. Now, there is a trade-off between novel stimuli and maintaining a routine. Novel stimuli, such as varying your study location, has been demonstrated to improve recall and retention. However, for some, this works directly against the benefits of a routine. 
The routine of waking up at the same time, studying in the same place, etc., may facilitate productivity and fight off procrastination. The novel stimuli of studying in new locations and with new people may impede your ability to get into the groove and maintain productivity long term. I found myself studying in usually the same spaces. Either I was in my med school in the empty classrooms, which is when I usually did group study, or I was at home studying solo with my optimal setup. Now, in terms of timing and pacing, one of my all-time favorite study hacks is the Pomodoro Technique. Essentially, you focus on one task, study in these 25-minute blocks, take five-minute breaks, and it sounds very simple, but it actually is super effective at fighting procrastination, improving your focus, and maintaining endurance. I go over how you can use it most effectively in my Pomodoro video. Third, let's talk about obtaining the information. Generally, you're going to be obtaining information in one of two ways as a pre-med, either lecture or textbooks. During lecture, most of us follow along with our own copy of the PowerPoint, and we just take notes in the comment section. This is a very passive way of learning. Here are some other options to improve your methods of obtaining information. First, consider writing versus typing your notes. Each, of course, has its pros and cons. Typing is faster, which sounds great initially, but if you type faster, you are able to transcribe what the professor is saying verbatim. That is not good. This, this is a very passive way of taking notes. By writing, you generally write much slower, and therefore you have to emphasize the important information and rephrase and organize it into your own words. Writing in comparison to typing has also been demonstrated to improve recall, possibly due to the increased motor coordination required for writing. When I was in med school, styluses aren't what they are today, and I opted for typing in some classes and writing on paper in others, particularly for my summary sheets, which we'll get to later. But now with the Surface Pro and the iPad Pro with Apple Pencil, you can get the best of both worlds. Check out my video on how to most effectively take notes with the iPad and Apple Pencil. Second, let's talk about lecture versus podcast. Your school may offer audio or video recordings of your lectures, and for me, this worked best. However, there are, of course, distinct advantages to attending lectures in person. For lecture, you have this set routine, and you're surrounded by other people who are doing the exact same thing. It helps reduce distraction and encourages you to be engaged in the lecture, at least more so than if you were listening to a podcast at home. You're also able to ask questions in real time. But the podcast, on the other hand, gives you the flexibility to watch whenever you want, meaning you can watch the lecture on your own schedule when you're well-rested and feeling fresh. You can also watch it at increased speeds. I personally opted for 1.5 or 2 times playback speed. Zoning out with slow speaking lectures was a big issue for me, and that's why I love the ability to speed up the podcast, because it helped keep me engaged and focused. That being said, be careful of the temptation of podcasting, because it requires a great deal of discipline to stay on track and not fall behind. If you are the type of student who would procrastinate with podcasting, do yourself a favor and stick to attending lectures instead. Okay, now let's talk about re-watching lectures. This is a total waste of time. I understand the thought process behind it. You want to make sure you didn't miss anything important, and you want to reinforce the content, repetition. The problem is that re-watching lectures is extremely passive, even more so than attending it the first time. Your time is better spent reviewing the information, synthesizing it, and doing active learning, questions, flashcards, etc. Do not re-watch the lectures or re-listen to recordings. Use your textbook, other resources, your classmates, or your professor's office hours if you need clarification. Now let's move on to textbooks. I used to highlight my textbooks and read my highlights several times to review prior to exams, but that's obviously a terribly passive way to study. Reviewing your PowerPoint slides or Word documents is also equally ineffective. Instead, make the process as active as you can, even at the time of initial exposure. Using either your computer or notepad, summarize what you read into your own words. By doing this, you are identifying the important information and organizing it in a way that you will understand. This whole process will ultimately drastically improve your recall during test time. Lastly, let's cover memorization. Memorization is arguably the toughest part of studying, at least for most students. There are a few different methods you can use to memorize information much faster and much more effectively. First, summary sheets, which some people like to call condensed notes. One of the best ways to memorize is to summarize the information. Let's say you have three pages of notes for one lecture. 
condense them into one page by organizing and restructuring the information into smaller chunks. And I don't just mean decreasing the font size, adjusting the margins. I mean actually go through and read your notes carefully and extract the highest yield points and rephrase them again into your own words. This process of condensing alone is a form of active learning and it will reinforce the material. But now you also have this condensed study resource that you can review at a later date. One of the most powerful ways to memorize information is spaced repetition. We know that repetition is key to memorization. The idea here is that after each review, you can increase the interval between reviews. For example, you are exposed to the information on day zero, then you see it again after 24 hours, and then after that, another 72 hours, etc. Instead of reviewing it every day, you only review it right before you're about to forget. To perform space repetition on your own requires a lot of scheduling, and it's not feasible. That's why you need to use software like Anki. I have a playlist of tutorials that go over exactly how to use it. I recommend that you make your own flashcards within Anki and review them daily. By making your own cards versus just taking someone else's, you are again taking advantage of the active learning process. Reviewing your cards daily is also key because otherwise you won't be taking advantage of the spaced repetition. A big reason why flashcards are so effective is because you're using recall rather than recognition. Recognition shows you the right answer and you tell yourself, oh yeah, I recognize that. Whereas recall requires you to extract the information on the fly, which is ultimately more similar to test day. The beautiful thing about flashcards is you don't have to sit down and spend 30 or 60 minutes at once. To get through all my cards each day, I would just open the Anki app on my phone at any brief moment of downtime. I would go through cards when I was, you know, waiting in line at a restaurant or getting groceries or waiting for a friend. In those few minutes, I was able to perform a handful of cards. But this adds up throughout the day. In order to sit down and review one lecture, it's going to take you 20 minutes at least. But if you do a few flashcards, you just need a few minutes. Now, these are all of the strategies that I honed during medical school. If I went deep into each topic, this video would be 10 times the length. If you'd like to know more about memorization, Pomodoro, the Feynman technique, or any other study strategy that I mentioned in this video, there are links down in the description to teach you more. Let me know down in the comments what your favorite study hack is, or if you want me to cover another study strategy in an upcoming video. Thank you all so much for watching. Happy studying, good luck, and I will see you guys in that next one. All right. And then I had another video about the Pomodoro technique from the same um, user. Oh, looks like someone has another question about lab. All right. Um, you can start talking or um, send it in the chat, whatever you prefer. Question 3738. Uh, I was looking at the four experimental designs they gave, mm -hmm. and what I'm really struggling is which almost randomly distributes the genotypes and environmental treatments to minimize the bias. I'm the thing is, I am pretty sure it's not design A or design B because neither of them are random in any case because design A chooses to always put the uh, one of them always in the bottom left while design B uh, groups them together with themselves, which isn't random either. But C and D, I can't really tell that much difference between them. Okay, let's take a look. Um... My current guess for the answer is C because uh, the number of sunstalks grown in clean soil, uh, there's an equal amount of them, I think, in the top rows of each box compared to uh, the ones grown in contaminated soil, but I'm uh, not sure if that's the answer. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. So um, you were talking about the different types of soil. So in design, in design C, um, each block has a different type of plant that has 
a different genotype in a different environment. And um, within each of those blocks, those sunstocks or those plants are random. Um, so um, the randomization between the three different blocks um, would help would help reduce bias because the randomization will help control for other um, like unaccounted for factors, if that makes sense. Well, I just realized that I'm um, scrolling and I didn't see the what's it called the genotypes on the. I had my PDF too far zoomed out, so I didn't see the, the genotypes. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay. All right. Um, do you have any other questions? Um, that was kind of everything I had. Um, I'm going to stay on. I might turn my mic off and my video off, but I'll still be here for the next 30 minutes. So feel free to shout out a question or send it in the chat and then we can go over it. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. I hope this was somewhat helpful. And um, if there ever isn't a um, like recording or talking point for you to go to, um, Discord is a great resource. Um, Dr. Plows and the other TAs, we are usually on there a few times a day or throughout the day. So someone should be able to answer your questions there too. And then also um, collaborate with your classmates. Um, and yeah, so, if you need anything, just let me know.
Okay, um, it's almost that time. I hope this was helpful. And if you have any more um, questions or anything, you can email me or um, send a question in Discord and one of us um, will be able to get to it. Um, Dr. Plows made a really nice kind of schedule for students for the semester, like what you should be doing every day to stay on track. So I would highly recommend sticking to that as close as possible. Um, and then kind of trying out different studying techniques that will work for you, um, figuring out what works best for you um, for each class is really important. And I will see you at this time next week.